What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Nursing Uncharted. This is Maggie Reichard, your host for this podcast. Thank you so much for listening again today. And if you're on Instagram, we are also on Instagram at Nursing Uncharted, and we post video highlights of the episodes throughout the week. So if you want to taste of the episode before you listen, go ahead and go on there. Um, but today, We are going to be talking about another avenue of advanced practice nursing, and that is the clinical nurse specialists. And clinical nurse specialists are, in my opinion, they're one of the most integral parts of a health system team, and we'll get into why in a minute. Um, But today, I want to introduce you to Scott Dara. He is a clinical nurse specialist whose experience is rooted in patient care within acute care general medicine. Scott has been a nurse for 11 years with his bedside experience being in critical care before he became a CNS. Scott leverages his experience prior to nursing school to connect with patients in genuine ways. His clinical passions lie in empowering frontline nurses to connect meaningful healthcare to their patients. Scott helped develop clinical pathways to care for COVID patients over the past year, synthesizing frontline needs and interdisciplinary connectivity to produce top decile outcomes for patients. Outside of nursing, the nursing realm, Scott enjoys playing PS5 or getting together with his D&D group and spends some, shares his spare time with his wife over 20 years and their two dogs. So Scott, welcome to the show. Uh, welcome, Maggie. Thanks for having me on here. I'm so happy to have you. This is great. Yeah, this is good. It's been a little while in the making, yeah? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I know. Once I started you know, coming up with this idea to do the podcast, I was like, I really want to have CNS on because I've talked to you about this before. I really you know, thought about CNS in my own personal like you know, developing my career. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm super excited to talk to you about CNS <laughs> and what that entails. Yeah, well, I hope I hope to do the profession some justice here. Yeah, yeah. so I want to talk about kind of what I mean, what the general role is of CNS and what your specific focus, because I think a lot of some health systems, I mean, they're kind of scarce. Some some mm-hmm. don't have them, some do. So go ahead and just like give a general like description of what CNS. Yeah, is. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll do. I'll do my best to summarize. So. Uh, clinical nurse specialists are one of the four branches of advanced practice nursing. So everyone's very familiar with nurse practitioners, mm-hmm. uh, probably as familiar uh, with certified nursing anesthetists. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's you know there's nursing midwives and there's clinical nurse specialists, and we all offer something a little bit different to our patients, to our health system. And so as a clinical nurse specialist. One of the easiest ways I've described it is think of like a nurse practitioner, but instead of a patient in the bed, your patient's the entire health system. <laughs> and so I think that's no like, you know, kind of, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> but um, if, if I'm imagining the avenues that I affect patient care, yes, of course I do it directly, but I, I'm definitely helping form policies involving practice, keeping up mm-hmm. with evidence-based literature, generating primary evidence as well to contribute to the body of science. And so, you know, we're trained in advanced patho, advanced pharmacology. In my state, we've just received um, prescriptive authority. And so we're pretty that. much able to practice at the top of our license, like our, our peer practitioners. And so we're going to be That's peeling awesome. the layers of that onion back too. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Have you, is there any talk about how that could potentially be implemented yet? Yeah, you, there's like, there's lots of talk about it, but not mm-hmm. a lot of idea how that fits in our current yeah. system, right? And so I think it's very site specific, you know, how, sure. you know, how's your, how's your setup at your place currently? Um, we have a lot of nurse practitioners and a lot of mm. physicians as a major teaching institution. So there's layers of physicians, you know. So mm-hmm. in some ways, one could say that would be redundant to uh, allow another person at the table to prescribe. However, um, there's a lot of opportunity um, and different flavors that that can take, right? Yeah. You know, I can... I can definitely do, you know, prescriptions for DME and things like that out the door and be the owner sure. of that aspect of care. Um, there's certain practitioners who have a very specific population whereby they're the right person to write prescriptions. I'm thinking of my pain, uh, chronic pain management colleagues yeah. and things like that, 
we have a diabetic clinic owner specialist who would be chomping at the bit to do this type mm-hmm. of work on their own. And so, um, you know, as a body, we have prescriptive authority, but as an individual, it's going to be very practice driven. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's a testament to kind of the CNS role in general, mm-hmm. right? Like you kind of see a need for a position and you fill it, you see a problem and you fix it. You see like a lack of education somewhere and you facilitate that. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like that's kind of, in my experience, that's kind of what I've seen. Every CNS is yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just like um, a, a, a bedside nurse, right? You know, sky's the limit for the type of care you can provide, the type of populations you serve. And, you know, being in the confines of a, a single unit or a single practice is helpful when you get started. But as soon as you get there, it's it's very quick to realize how you're defining the style and, and art of the nurse that you are, even in your domain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my role as a critical care practitioner at the bedside, you know, one of my biggest identifiers was the gap between acute care and critical care, you know, yeah. our facility didn't have an intermediate care space, right? And so there were a lot of patients who were going out at the tail end of critical care, sight unseen, and then, you know, we'd see them a day or two later and wonder, huh, that, that didn't quite go well, you know? And then over the years, you pay attention and you kind of learn and follow your patients and realize there's more outside, right? And so, yeah. Yeah, identifying those practice gaps and applying some evidence-based practice and through the lens of the clinical nurse specialist helps focus the the outcomes, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, that's an interesting problem to have, like that middle space between critical care and acute care. Like we have people in such boxes, mm-hmm. you know, like their Q1 hour, you know, vitals and all of them, we're monitoring them so closely and then we're going to take off all of their telemetry and watch them every four hours. (laughs) And, you know, like having that and also the, the like knowledge base of the two nurses is very different too. So you, you have like specific problems that you're looking at in the ICU and then that's kind of not prioritized as much, you know, in the acute care. And I've seen you do this where mm-hmm. you like explain those processes of the things that they're looking at in critical care. And, um, I remember one guy, he was, he was like 18. He was on, um, and he had, he was in rhabdo. He was in rhabdomyolysis mm-hmm. because he was doing a lot of drugs. And I think he was like running away from somebody. And then, like all of his systems like shut down. (laughs) And I remember you feeling like he was a ticking time bomb. And Mm -hmm. I didn't uh, really understand that, I guess, because I had all of my like acute care things that I was focusing on. And so I remember you like walking through, like, these are all the reasons why this patient can, is like, you know, teetering on ICU versus acute Mm -hmm. care. And it really helped me. Yeah, no, I'm glad, I'm glad I could be directly helpful. I think one of those, (laughs) One of those things that I, I struggled with in my transition from a critical care bedside expert, right, to a acute care pretender, you know, <laughs> uh, for a little bit, you know, I had good book knowledge, but never worked in acute care. And so just mm-hmm. didn't understand the neighborhood I was getting in, right? And I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head in the microcosm of a single patient. There's so much you're ready to do in your practice that you're beyond expert even then I am at that point, you know, just last summer, but knowing why you're doing something is just as important, if not more so. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, in my role, bringing that to light and putting the tools in the hands of the practitioners who know best how to use them is, is really where I thrive. And yeah, sure. I can recite a lot of pathophysiology and I'm, I'm I'm really good at, you know, vasopressor titration and escalation. And, you know, I'm getting pretty darn good at discharging people to the community, but I not there all the time, 24 seven for folks. And so Mm -hmm. uh, spending the time just to kind of get one light bulb flickering for one person is key. Doing it enough gives me enough inkling to say, well, maybe there's an opportunity to enhance our population care for folks in, you know, acute renal failure related to rhabdo, for example. You know, or perhaps there's a few folks who are aligned enough to say that I'm going to pick up that torch and be the person who's also now my unit expert in this. Yeah. So you kind of, you know, in, in your own neighborhood, you 
you know, put the tools out there where people may find the best use for them, um, connect them in ways that you think are the right fit, but be vigilant enough to let people use and leverage them in the way that they know how. Yeah. And be, and be, you know, kind of remove my ego from that situation and be like, okay, now what are we collectively doing to add up to an outcome for this patient? Yeah. And yeah, it, it is, um, that, that's where I find the magic still. You know, is, is that ability just to, you know, sure, I'm going to be very didactic and be very um, <laughs> educational in the moment, but I know it works because it changes the day in the next four to eight hours, right? Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're critically thinking now and, and I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. So therefore I'm, I'm more able to be a part of the care team. And I think yeah. that's super important. Well, it's a domino effect too. I mean, mm-hmm. once, once, every, I mean, for me, every time I like learn a piece of information that I didn't know before, I always pass it on to the next person because it's also going to facil- facilitate their care for that same mm-hmm. patient. And so, you know, and the more you're, you feel aware of what's going on with the patient, the more empowered you feel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the more connected you can feel with your nurses and it helps the whole culture of the unit. So, it's a great person to have, CNSs. Yeah, yeah it's kind of nice. I think one of the the things I'm, I feel I might be most envious about people is like, think about days when you're at work and you have your group back, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and some days when you have like, you know, a chronic group, you know, for the next three days, you're off a day and you have them again for another two or three days. I, I feel like your care on that day four, day five, day six is just so much better than it was day one and day two. Oh yeah. Um, because you know the subtle things to look for. You're aware of the personal story you've seen evolve from your care and from your handover's care from that night or that day. Mm-hmm. I have the luxury of being there five, six days a week. And I get to see a lot of patients during that time. That list today, I think, was 112 patients, you know, that I know in some fashion, right? I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to give you a report on 112 <laughs> patients. <laughs> right. But 15, so you know 15 of there. them, yeah, 15 of them I know really well. And being in that role a long enough time, I know a number of people from the times I've cycled through. Mm-hmm. And so just being able to be back, you know, for my next day, several, several days, several weeks, several months has just been such a, a lovely thing to build relationships with patients and to also fast forward that care at the bedside that day. You know, mm-hmm. you, you you really can just kind of go and give a micro report of 10 years of history for a patient, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And that nurse is now just emboldened to be crushing it for that admission. Right. Yeah. And I don't know. It's it's so cool to be given those sort of gifts just by <laughs> being being paying attention. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I know after if I have a patient for, you know, a couple weeks in a row or like four or five days, it's like giving report to a new nurse. It's like, where did I be? Yeah. Like <laughs> so much has begin? happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even know. Yeah. Oh, gosh. What do you think are some of the common misconceptions of the CNS role, if any? You know, I mean, um, I think I hear and I feel a lot CNS CNSs are educators, right? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of institutions hire CNSs to run their educational backbone for the health system, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. I think a lot of people have had experience with the CNS. Uh, provider in previous settings where they are the educator of the unit or the group. Yeah. And so you, you kind of know exactly who an educator is, what they do and, you know, what skills day looks like or, or whatever, you know, there's a cadence and a yearly thing that kind of feels like the same and you get, you get boxed into that mm-hmm. pretty readily, at least on the surface. Yeah. I think that's kind of, that's kind of one of the more consistent ones I see for us. I think the the other ones are clinical nurse specialists or, or just a, an advanced bedside practitioner, and so mm-hmm. I, I see you know and I, I feel like there there's a lot of folks who would say that oh that's a nurse who can take you know seven acute care patients instead of just four right <laughs> they're because they're nurse. just that good right and <laughs> and and in some ways maybe but I think anyone who's been around a while can take a, a little bit more load but it just you, you just kind of feel like an uber nurse as opposed to <laughs> an, an advanced practice licensed independent practitioner right yeah and so it's <laughs> yeah. um you know those things like that and I, I, we still fall in the same tropes that that nurses have in general right. Um, mm-hmm. You know that you're, you're some sort of hierarchical position that you and the physician have. That the physician runs the show and the nurse is there to follow orders, mm-hmm. right? You know, and in in a, in a nutshell, that, that's functionally what it may look like. But really, it's a cohesive, symbiotic group that needs each other to work, right? Like the, yeah. 
physician has a lot of time to look at a cellular level sort of thing, come up with the best guess, but the nurse has to do the, the experiment, right? Has to yeah. work with the patient and align the care and do the teaching and also be vigilant to what's working, what's not working and bring everybody together, right? The, right. the glue, the glue that holds the, everything together. And there's the um, quote. Oh, yeah. I got to remember this quote. There's a really, there's, okay. It's from, um, Donna Deers. It just made me think of this. It's, <laughs> it's a really good quote pertaining to nursing and, um, you know, like why nurses want to be nurses and not oh, like a, you know, something uh, like a higher in the hierarchy. It said, Mm -hmm. it's from Donna Deers said, um, nursing, um, is about being, having an indifference to power for power's own sake. It's a pleasure associated with helping others from the position of a peer rather than an assumed super support, superordinate. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was like a great, that just made me think of that quote that you know, it's very much, you know, it, it is, you want to deliver care on the same, you know, level at, at like as patients or like peers instead of, you know, talking down to people. And like, yeah, exactly. Like, right. It's this equilateral triangle, right? Like everyone is participating. And I think I've probably shared with you this a, a time or two. There's like a, a, a spectrum that healthcare personnel has to meet the patient a hundred percent of the way all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the patient's job is is simply to be receptive to that plan. And half the time, our job is just to, to coax the patient along the way to, you know, change their lifestyle to, you know, maybe not use the substance so much, or maybe just to to adhere to a regimen because that's our only way to get good data to see if it's working or not. Right. Yeah. But there's a balance that once that connection starts to happen is, how do I ebb and flow with the real life of things, right? When it got me kind of thinking a little bit earlier about this, I see you kind of transition. I control a lot of things in that world, right? I'm your heart, I'm your lungs, I'm, you mm-hmm. know, creating blood pressure for you where it doesn't exist. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. about how all the cells jive. But at some point, those amalgamation of chemicals need to stand up and walk and do it themselves. <laughs> and so right. that's, I, I find my acute care colleagues and, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get pretty good at it too, can realize it and see it and just, it gets, it's messy sometimes. Right. Yeah. And the way we coordinate that is, is a very powerful thing. Mm-hmm. And I think being a member of that coordination is probably, is one of the more humbling aspects of the job. Yeah. Right. You know, as an advanced practice nurse, as a CNS, I'm no more or less important than anyone in the care team. Right. Mm-hmm. And my job is just like the bedside nurse in a lot of ways is to be the glue to bring resource to the situation. Yeah. To see if we can maximize what everyone's mutually trying to get out of it and what's meaningful. We will be right back to this episode. We just want to take a brief moment to shout out the company that makes this show possible. American Mobile. If you're a nurse interested in traveling, visit AmericanMobile.com to explore the amazing benefits that American Mobile has to offer. Featuring short and long-term contract opportunities at leading facilities across the country with higher earning potential, W-2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, American Mobile is your advocate for career success. Visit AmericanMobile.com to begin your travel nursing adventure today. And now back to the show. I've, I've seen that a lot in transitioning from the out of acute care and into the ICU mm-hmm. where, uh, you know, a lot of times the goal, you know, you are doing all of these things for, for the patient because they can't do, do them themselves. A lot yeah. of, you know, healing the body. And then when they come to, if they're extubated, you know, they go back onto the floor, but a lot of the responsibility is put back on the patient and it's frustrating Mm -hmm. when they don't, you know, seek that same strive to get themselves healthy or, you know, they don't want to, you know, participate in that same goal to optimize their, their health. It is, it's, it's a super frustrating aspect of, of acute care nursing. You know, you, you put all of your efforts into this person that potentially doesn't want to take care of themselves the way that you would hope. Yeah. I imagine, you know, I don't have children. I imagine a parent probably goes through those sorts of feelings, right? When, <laughs> when their youngins moving through their teenage years and just bound and determined to make their own choice 
You right. know it's a terrible choice sometimes, you know, because you've done it, you yeah. know, because you just did it last week and it was a bad idea. <laughs> and I think the, the, the real maturity shows up is when you leave room for that. And so, you know, I've, I've done a lot of precepting new nurses and I find that that shape and that structure with all of its safety nets is, is the closest you'll get to providing patient care all the time. And that's because you have such an open, honest, vulnerable space for two people to learn each other and learn a, a, a new practice together, you leave room for your orientee to go out and, and skin their knees, if you will, or, or make a bad choice or say something wrong mm-hmm. in rounds or teach something improperly to a patient because it's not over yet, right? Like the, mm-hmm. the spectrum of care and time continues on and you can generally go back and either fix it, learn from it own up to, hey, you know, when I came in and asked you that question, I didn't have all the details, you know, let me let me reframe that or whatever. Yeah. And it's all just big practice to take really good care of people, yeah. right? Because they're, same just as you described, patients sometimes don't make the best decisions. They're not ready to change yet. They're pre-contemplative and, you know, whatever modification you're trying to do, but you got to leave room for them, man, because mm-hmm. you, you've got, the better you do today, the more likely you're going to see them the next day. And as long yeah. as your foot's on the gas the whole time, that might be the perfect storm where they're ready to to take on that new challenge and change yeah. something. Or, you know, what the five times you tried before, the sixth time is when it really starts to stick and now you're making progress. Yeah. And and I think that's I don't know. I think you can take that anywhere you go, you know. It's it's a pretty cool skill to have. Yeah. I know I mean, yeah, probably one of the best things to do for people is just to continue to give them resources to not I mean, there's kind of there's a blurred line where mm-hmm. you don't want to put too much effort in because then that's like a lot of emotional investment into <laughs> your patients, which I've gotten in trouble too before, but or, you know, but you want to see them succeed. So mm-hmm. just, you know, saying these are all the resources resources for you. This is how we can, you know, manage your care and and you know, see where they take it and hope, hope for the best when they leave the hospital. Yeah, no, I find, um, I used to be very staunch about keeping my person out of care in a way, right? Because there's a lot, there's a parentological approach that we kind of described a little bit of, but you got to know where that line blurs enough for you to know that you're, you're projecting, right? Mm -hmm. And so like one of the bigger lessons I teach people mostly so I can keep hearing myself say it is, is healthcare doesn't have an ego, right? You don't matter. And while we just described the equality of the nursing team to the the rest of the providers as as being on equal footing, it's not because you, Maggie, are the nurse. It's because you're an important role. And so how I feel as Scott doesn't matter in this conversation. I bring a lot of schools, a lot of skills, and I have to be able to walk that tightrope of, I personally don't feel this way, or I'm personally frustrated at you for making this choice. And I think it's really powerful to turn that on and turn that off in good ways. So people mm-hmm. often voice they don't feel connected as humans, right? They feel like a pincushion or they feel like, you know, some sort of experiment. And mm-hmm. I think it is because a lot of people just blank out that human aspect and yeah. say, this is Nick Bison. We will gather your troughs at 6 a.m. And then <laughs> that trough shall guide us forward forever and all. You know, but you forget that that person maybe has slept yeah. two hours and there's some methodology to, to still being a human, right? And I think in some ways nurses have a little bit easier because our job is fully being human beings for a lot of the days, right? Yeah. And we, we hit the ground running in our practice clinically to be with humans all the time. And, and our, our mm. medicine school colleagues spend a lot of time in the classroom and a lot of time in lab and a lot of time doing things other than that, that that's a skill they're, they're bringing up. And they catch up and they do it really well. Yeah. But I think that's something we bring to the table to help Absolutely. reflect that to the care team. And you know, I, I find days that I cry with my patients. I find days that I'm just angry with them, you know, and mm-hmm. sometimes at them, you know, are some of the most real days that you yeah. don't even remember you're getting a paycheck that day. And that's, that's pretty cool, but it's not something you feel in the moment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very, yeah. I liked yeah. what you said where you said, you know, that there's so much clinical aspect that you have to gather and know and then go into the day of just being a human for the whole day. I mean, I think that's such a, it's, it's such a great summary wrap up of what nurses do, right? Like you, you have to have so much background knowledge about what goes in, but you really don't, you don't 
you know, voice all of those things to the patient. You have a normal conversation with the patient about how's your pain? Have you gotten up today? Yeah. You know, how's, you know, have you had a bowel movement? Like <laughs> these are your vitals. This <laughs> is the plan, but you don't run through like really intricately all of the things that you're thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, you ain't got time for that. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> because there's not like one patient for the day and maybe you could do half of that. I, mean, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's one of those things that is, you save it for what one patient who needs it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, for the listener that's, um, you know, thinking about CNS, tell me a little bit about the schooling process and what, um, you know, how you become a CNS Mm -hmm. and then what type of characteristics could potentially be a strong CNS candidate? Yeah, I can probably answer the last part of that question first, only in the sense that we've been talking a little bit about things that I feel passionately about, obviously, is that that human aspect of nursing and that, Mm -hmm. you know, knowing yourself so you can not be yourself with patients and be the best nurse you can be. And I think a high caliber CNS prospect is probably someone who doesn't settle for the status quo, who's always asking why, you know, yeah. like, well, you mm-hmm. know, we did this for patient A and it totally worked and patient B, we did the same, if not more, and it totally didn't. Why is that? You know, yeah. and, and, and not settling for good enough, you know, there's, mm-hmm. and, and kind of also someone who's really interested in just being the, the conduit for making everything around you better. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if you're a good charge nurse, you're a good preceptor, you, you just happen to connect with patients in a, in a good way and you do it consistently, chances are you're probably going to be an amazing CNS. Mm. Um, and because it just it just gives you that f- extra tools in your toolkit to, to yeah. know why you're doing it and to be prospective about it as opposed to being a victim of circumstance and just happen sure. to be awesome in the moment. Um, for as far as schooling goes, I think... I identified early in my career, very type A kind of guy, um, got into school probably mid-20s, late-20s, and finished when I was 30. So not exactly a traditional student, but once I was running, I was running hard. Mm -hmm. So how fast can I get to something cooler? Um, Luckily, I had a really good teaching environment that says, slow your roll, junior. There's a whole lot more to learn before (laughs) you start running past us. And, you know, good thing is a lot of uh, postgraduate schools want you to um, have a couple years of practice anyway. So that worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I think you need a good two years experience typically for most accredited programs, sometimes okay. a little more. Sometimes you can be acquiring that by the time you finish, but you need a couple of years under your belt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, as far as just work-life balance is super key for that. Luckily, mm-hmm. you're learning enhanced skills to do what you're already doing. Yeah. And so in, in a lot of ways, it's like if you really thrive during orientation because of all the learning you were doing, well, great. Here's a good way to pay lots of money to do more of that. (laughs) Um, But if you're someone who struggles with that, I think making a really good gut check of, of, you know, how much of this is going to burn me out before I just, you know, can't handle it at all versus how much is a good tension to put on me to realize that, yeah, it's going to be a lot of hard work, but here's the payoff. And that's, this is what I'm willing to sacrifice in the moment. And so for me, I worked full time and Mm -hmm. went to school, you know, full time, um, that's, I think a, an ethic I've had since I was 15, having three jobs all the time, honestly, just <laughs> doing, like, oh, you know, this is right. yeah, whatever. This, is, this is only, yeah, it's only like 60 hours Two a jobs. week. This is, this is easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, functionally it was very difficult. Mm-hmm. And, um, I had surrounded myself with a number of folks who were able to, get by with me when I was struggling to write a paper sometimes at work, don't tell my boss, Um, you know, just because it was just where I had the time to do Mm -hmm. it and where the thoughts came to do it. Yeah. And was able to just make it all work while still providing, you know, top notch care to everything. Um, But I was also able, and I'm very applicable science kind of guy. I'm never going to make an A in class, but I'm going to make that C grow to something I'll never forget. And so I applied most everything I learned directly. And I found that to be super enriching, right? Like there, there were things and ideas I never really thought of because why do I need to? I know this intracellular function of catecholamines. Well, who cares what discharge looks like, you know? Yeah. Well, guess, you know, but hey, if I start to just think about it a little bit, it changed exactly what I did at work forever, right? Yeah. In that semester and then onward. Yeah. Because I, I was able to 
fiddle with that idea a little bit and connect it. And so I think for the yeah. person in grad school or contemplating it, just be ready to be constantly cycling through expert and humility because you, you think you got it, you learn something new that just opens up the whole new world that you're just another little goldfish in an ocean again. Yeah. And I think that that's, once you get on that cycle, it's, it's really rewarding. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it's it's like a back and forth, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, your expectation of what you learn from class is, is humbled by what you see, you know, in clinical and in the clinical yes. setting. And then the, the latter, you know, you're like, well, why does I see learning <laughs> yeah, all this I, I extra challenge, things? I challenge any nurse that crushed the NCLEX the first time to think that the is that the best nursing is? Like, I don't think so, right? Because I think as soon as you think you got it, you get really taught in the job. You get taught in the yeah. moment. And so, you know, grad school was humbling that way. Um, having a good work-life balance in the sense of appreciating what was going to draw me away from my goals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, having a, a, you know, kind of a baller wife really helped too, you know, like just having yeah. someone in my corner, like just, you know, hey, buddy, it sucks. Let me just uh, take <laughs> take care of this, uh, you know, pile of clothes or whatever today. You're doing it tomorrow, but I see today is hard. You know, yeah. you just need that. And, yeah. and I think just knowing what your support system is going to look like yeah, um, is is very good strategy. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love... I loved orientation because of that, mm-hmm. because of that reason. Cause I felt like I was, you know, facilitating, I'm learning all of this stuff, you know, and being able to immediately apply it with that like instant gratification of, you know, this is exactly <laughs> what's going on with the patient. And so when I think of going back to school and CNS is something that I've seriously considered and just like hearing mm-hmm. you talk about, you know, understanding those how it works with your current patients that you're seeing. It's so exciting to me to hear. Yeah, no, and I, 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 I thrive on the unknown. You know, if I can mm-hmm. pick it apart, learn it, apply it, and see if it evolves my total way of thinking is, is really fun to me. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the what's interesting to me at the program I took, the didactic or the preclinical work in grad school mm-hmm. for nurse practitioners and for clinical nurse specialists was the exact same. And so I think given the volume of clinical nurse specialists, I think in my program, there were maybe six or eight folks Mm -hmm. compared to the 90 folks who were in nurse practitioner school. We all come out with the same didactic knowledge. And it's it's so interesting how applying that skill differs you on what roles you fill and where you go. And I, I think it's just kind of a little unifying theory to some of the things we've been talking about is there's a lot of common ground for a lot of people and what you yeah. do with it's super important, yeah. different, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And you found yourself um, in a really interesting role last year for mm-hmm. the units um, during COVID. Tell me a little bit about the position that you found yourself in and what proved to be some of the biggest challenges from last year. Um, I think there's a couple different positions you may have seen me in last year. And I think... Um, <laughs> everywhere. You were everywhere. Yeah, I think I was kind of <laughs> everywhere, right? And so um, with the stunning of COVID showing up in overwhelming health systems across the country, right? I think um, in our mid-Atlantic area, I think we weren't quite looking like New York city, for example, you know, or, mm-hmm. or the, the upper West coast by any means, but not knowing where you're going with that is an existential threat of something mm-hmm. you just haven't seen. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I make, have a habit of watching zombie movies and things like that. And not that we were anywhere close to that apocalypse. <laughs> you do kind of see like, is this the beginning really? of is some this- movie I'm about to watch? <laughs> this is very unsettling. Yeah. Um, in my role, I think we were very well positioned, not only in my unit, but um, just in our service as medicine. I think our group was taking care of COVID patients, mm-hmm. right? And I think that was just the natural placement. Yeah. Um, in our acute setting, our sister ICU unit only has finite space and has to reserve resources and looking upstream and watching people run out of ventilators and stuff. Let's start thinking about that stuff now. So in our mm-hmm. acute unit, we started playing with the idea of how do you provide care for COVID patients? You know, what mm-hmm. does it look like? Who does it? Like who helps? And, you know, what are the steps? And you're sitting there like from 
nothing I've ever seen in my nursing career where it was like, is there a resource on how to do this, right? Do I have Lippincotts? Do I have YouTube? Do I have, Mm -hmm. you know, a friend I knew in school across the country that could just say, have you ever seen this? It doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Um, except for a few like Chinese manuals that you have to have translated and hope that that's accurate because the science was evolving so rapidly. Yeah. Um, so I think I had a beard that would have gone out of the frame of this camera (laughs) and in an effort to provide the best for my team and for myself and just to be present, you know, you can get rid of it, you know, you just lose 20 years and 20 pounds in in a heartbeat. And we are actively going through these PDCA cycles of how do you do simple things like put gloves on? Like, how do I have someone watch you and walk you through the process of Mm -hmm. taking off your gown and doing it in a way that saves the PPE for the next who knows how many times? Right. And how do I do it in a way that I could still go into the room and act like I got it for my patient who's just also right there with us, you know? So true. And so I... I'd like to say there's a lot of things I did. I think there's a lot of things we did as a team, you know, and being mm-hmm. that constant person there was well positioned to kind of keep the iterations and the versions growing and connecting mm-hmm. our infectious control department with our EVS mm-hmm. colleagues, with our supply chain, with our, you know, leadership chain and, and epidemiology and, and really just trying to be the glue to keep my sick patient, the health system that's at risk right now, yeah. afloat. And that was, that's you know, what I was going to say. And, you're just yeah. the connector for all of these. Different, right. You're the, you're like one of the, you know, minority that is being able to zoom out and look at everything mm-hmm. and figure out, you know, what everybody's going to need. Yeah. And so you find yourself in a whole spectrum of things where it's really calm and collective. We got it together. It's a frustrating avenues of logic that doesn't quite fit. And I'm just trying to say, what do we collectively communicate to our our nursing body and our clinical body here of what we're doing and what our next step is and how do we tension the transparency of we just don't know these things, Mm -hmm. you know, because there's there's a fine line to walk in a community effort like that to say nobody knows what they're doing and we don't know if we have enough PPE, but come to us for healthcare. And that's a really hard product to put out there, but there's a nuanced way to do it that you level expectations and you invite others to that solution of the problem. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, learning, learning that out loud with a group was something I, I hope to never repeat, but Mm -hmm. something I'll never forget. Right. And I think that was like, I think that was one aspect, right? So we codified the process of admitting, discharging, transferring, cleaning, dressing, and caring for patients. And I think the other things is I got to dust off my direct bedside chops, right? Because I think (laughs) our institution was not unique in the sense that the, the ebb of business flow stopped abruptly. And a lot of places rely on revenue generated from their footprint as a healthcare system, right? It's not just the ED on up to mm-hmm. the, you know, surgical suites. It's clinic work. It's, you know, all of the, the schooling and things like that. And so the whole community yeah. ground to a halt. And what that did was push a lot of people out of work temporarily in some places, right? So you had this like feast or famine. You had places that were couldn't get enough staff at all. To some yeah. places, crickets were chirping because there wasn't enough COVID to stay busy, but too much risk to keep everyone busy. I remember that um, being feeling so strange. Yeah, I was working it, as a as a traveler and in a surgical. I think I was in a surgical assignment, and you know, seeing all of these you know situations where people were just completely slammed and mm-hmm. you know had no nurses, and here I am, they're can't they were like you know every, travel nurses can't contracts were being canceled because there wasn't revenue coming in and they just didn't have the funds to, you know, continue the contract. And they also didn't have patients because a lot of people were staying at home for chronic diseases. They weren't any surgeries and it was just a very odd time. Yeah. And I think you're picking up on a couple of those, those nuances that, that fit into this. Right. And so, you know, an effort to kind of be the servant leader that I espouse to be right. You know, taking on, bedside work, shift work with my teams to kind of either backfill positions that our COVID team Mm -hmm. was going to provide just COVID care with a bunch of folks from a bunch of different walks of life stitched together to make a unit codify. 
And just getting to basics was uh, profoundly good, scary as all get out, but it's like you get to work and patient care is easy, right? Like I've been doing it for years. Yeah, Doing it with people I just met today is a little harder Mm -hmm. and acknowledging that and welcoming room for their tension and their fears and frustration was something Mm -hmm. that I spent three, four months of just yeoman's work of just listening to people and, and pulling it out of them and not settling for good enough during a time when if you didn't leave Mm -hmm. it all on the table to provide for your patients, there's very little you're going to be able to do for yourself. Yeah. And, and so just kind of, opening myself up to that. You know, we, we talk a lot about removing your human aspect of it, but sometimes you have to lay it bare to people. Yeah. And there were handovers where I was very tearful and frustrated at just everything. Mm-hmm. And you just got to show it. You just got to be present. And, yeah. you know, I think that was something I, I don't think I'll ever leave out of the toolbox, right? Like if you don't leave it out there for folks and show that you are there for that. It makes it really hard for them to listen to your rhabdomyolysis patho dissection, <laughs> right? <laughs> because because yeah. uh, who are you, right? You're just a walking <laughs> encyclopedia, but <laughs> If you're also the guy who helped, you know, 15 ambulatory pediatric nurses care for general medicine, total care patients, you get a little street cred that way and you get a little bit more of a a trusting presence no matter the avenue you're in. And so, yeah, well, I think um, making the space, you know, accepting of all of the frustration and the anger Mm -hmm. and, you know, keeping that conversation open of, yeah, this is, this is a mess, you know, like. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that that's in a way comforting because, you know, a lot of the nurses are feeling the same thing. And, and sometimes you feel like your needs are kind of glazed over what the needs are for, you know, the health system. And so I think that mm-hmm. that probably, that probably really helped facilitate a culture in that, in that setting. Yeah. I think time will tell, right? I think there's a lot of things like you mentioned there were patients avoiding chronicity follow-up care. There were folks staying at home who would normally be filling EDs. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of, you know, because the science was evolving so rapidly, there were a number of trust issues developed, you know, especially in the climate we were in yeah. at the time COVID was going on that, you know, I think we're, we were on the precipice of starting to see the fallout of some of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if I recall psychological classes, the PTSD that experiencing that as a te- team, as a culture, as, a, as an institution is, is profound. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I feel like the, the more that experience it, the, the more difficult it is to see you transition through phases of that, that processing. Yeah. And I think healthcare in general has been changed in ways we don't appreciate yet, but it's yeah. definitely not, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing ultimately, right? I think we gut checked our, what do, what do we really need to do kind of conversations versus what we'd like to do mm-hmm. and have to leave what we'd like to do behind. So we do the things we have to do. Yeah. And, and my hope is that that follows through with the way nurses are trained, with the way hospitals leverage their care teams to do that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that, but it's, going to be messy to get there. Yeah. Like there's there's going to be a ripple effect I think in all number of ways. That I was you know. going to ask as mm-hmm. as like your ability to kind of zoom out and seeing this like grander overview of the inner workings of the hospital and how everything played out last year. Do you feel like it's having that outlook has strengthened a confidence in the healthcare system for you or does it make you kind of worry about our future? Or maybe a little bit I of think, both. <laughs> I think just like trying something new for a patient population, sometimes it works great and sometimes it totally doesn't. And I think being okay to have that space to try is mm. very important for us collectively. I think there's going to be some health systems that that's all they needed that will flourish and won't look back. I think there'll be some who say, okay, well, that happened. Let's get back to what used to kind of almost work and hope that works again. And it might not, right? And and it, it it's not a, an intentional thing. I think mm-hmm. you know we we all bring our best forward when it comes to providing care and the the role that you fill there. And so I think persons who are doing it 
I think the field is wide open. You can go do a lot of things if it's not for you right now. But I would say to those who are struggling to see what is going to settle out, to be patient, you know, and to, to realize that today might not be the day it's awesome, you know, mm-hmm. but tomorrow can be. And I think if you're working in places that subsequent days aren't better than the days before you, it's just time for reevaluation in general. And I, you didn't need a pandemic to tell you that, but if it yeah. woke that up for you, that's great. But it's, it's very, very similar to taking care of patients, right? I, 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 I'd tell you as as a newer to the the ICU situation, just like I would tell someone in my gen med world, that if your patient's the same today as they were yesterday, they're actually getting sicker. Like they, <laughs> you need incremental progress day to day, hour to hour, or it's not working. Mm-hmm. And it might look okay, that's fine, but it's not good. And so I think that's how we should approach our careers. That's how we should approach our health system. That's how we should approach our science. Because it's how the yeah. art comes to life, right? If it's just got to be a little better, it doesn't have to be amazing, right? It could yeah. just be lunch was on time and it was good. You know, everyone liked it. It was perfect. You know, that's so much better than it was for breakfast, right? And <laughs> being okay to celebrate those little things because I, I, yeah. I do feel that having absolutely nothing else going on in the world than dealing with the chaos at work, it was a really good day when it was better than the day before. Yeah. And... I think it's one of the things that was the most gutting about having the pandemic and having it being so hard on nurses is that burnout was not a new thing before the pandemic, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and then we just added the pandemic right on top of it, just rubbed dirt in the wound. And, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, how that, how this all plays out in, in the future. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of burnout science that's getting dusted off or, or revisited mm. or, or even quite frankly created currently that, you know, I think as a body, healthcare has gone through this sort of deal where you are somehow responsible for your own resilience, right? Mm-hmm. And I think there's, there's a certain amount of resiliency that you got to have. There's a certain way you got to foster it. But I think this kind of lay bare the the holes in that theory and that you can't be responsible for building yourself up if something external completely tore it down. Yeah. And I think that's where we need each other more transparently and more honestly than we did before. Yeah. Right? And that's because I'm not that resilient. You're not that resilient, but put together, we can do some pretty awesome stuff, right? Yeah. And so I think if we can remember that, I mean, that could just be getting over, you know, a few bad things along the way, but making sure you make those connections helps rise all ships, I think. Yeah, absolutely. uh, And I think that there are resources, you know, I think it's so important to figure out what those resources are that are being cultivated in your hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, right now it kind of seems like, okay, well, you know, there's a website you can go to or, you know, there's like a, but you know, it's going to be a really important conversation to have in our health systems as far as, you know, what, what can we do to support each other and make sure that everyone is, is, you know, having better days than the next. Yes. Because, yeah. 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 I think there's, I think the cool kids will, will have it in, in a way that it's very transparent when you pull the help chain, someone's there. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that that's not an experience that every institution can have every single day, but I think the ones that have it probably figured out and what it looks like to be a resilient team or one that can stave off burnout as anyone humanly can in, in our jobs mm-hmm. is is one that truly is in it together. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, it takes it doesn't take a lot of effort to print a lot of things in a sign shop, but it takes a lot of effort to to hear the effect of my policy decision or the effect of the support I thought was good turns out wasn't good enough or wasn't the right position to be in, how do we correct that? Mm-hmm. And then actually showing that. And, yeah. you know, again, it's one of those things you got to have space for. It's not perfect every time you try. The fact that you are trying is good enough for me. Yeah. And and I, I think that's okay. It's very much like a relationship. You know, yeah. if, if my wife said, you know what, you know, ramen is the best I can do and that's all we'll get and sometimes I'll burn it. Tough cookies. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it's not her job to even cook for me, but gosh darn it. 
if, it, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Let's go get in there and get it done together, you know. And I think if we're yeah. just open to try to make it better, I think we're good. Yeah. I think in summary, I think this this whole episode has been about leaving space for yeah. error. And yes. it's okay to try. <laughs> it's definitely okay to try. CNSs have this thing called PDCA cycles. I think a lot of people have the same thing, but it's our bread and butter, right? It's, I have a plan. I need to do something. I need to study it. And then based on those results, I need to act on them. Mm-hmm. And it's a cycle. It's a continuous cycle. And I think I had a guru in my life, uh, Dr. Paul Helgerson, share with me the continuous improvement cycle, which is like two wheels of PDCA cycles moving each other forward <laughs> all the time. And it was like such a ridiculous mm. PowerPoint to look at, but <laughs> man alive, if it doesn't distill the complexity of our jobs into we're just doing little experiments together and sometimes they propel us forward and that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Well, I think that we are going to end it here. I think this is a great ending point, but thank you so much for coming. This was a great conversation. I'm so glad we had you on. Yeah, me too. It's my pleasure to to participate. Yeah. And hopefully we're going to have more conversations about CNS. That's something that something that Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in later on, later on when I want to go back to school. (laughs) (laughs) Let me, let me know. I might know a guy who can write a a pretty good recommendation letter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) All right, I'll talk to you soon. That brings us to the end of the show. Thanks for tuning in to Nursing Uncharted. To learn more about today's episode, make sure to explore the show notes at AmericanMobile.com slash Nursing Uncharted. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a guest. If you're a nurse interested in traveling, visit AmericanMobile.com to explore the largest database of travel nursing jobs in the industry and the amazing benefits that American Mobile has to offer. Also, a special thanks to producer Jonathan Carey, assistant producers Katie Schrauben and Sam McKay, and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. Until next time, take care of yourself.